In our second lesson in introducing the life of Christ, we're going to look at the culture in which Jesus lived. Before we move on, let me point out what we're um, doing with this background information. One of the greatest themes of the Gospels, and to Christians the theme of all of God's revelation in the Bible, is the ultimate victory of Jesus as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. There's much history in the Bible, but to us who are Christians, the central point is Jesus coming into the world, living as a person, giving himself on Calvary and rising from the dead. We believe that he is enthroned in heaven as the great king over all, that he will ultimately execute God's judgment for eternity. In order to understand who Jesus is, we need to go back to his incarnation, that is, his becoming human, and see how he lived. The great message of the gospel is that Jesus came to show us that God does know what human life is like. He experienced it through Jesus as a human. And he is qualified to be our king forever, reigning from heaven, partly because he has shown us that he understands us, that he has experienced what we experience. We all live in a time and culture. Jesus' time and culture is Israel, during the time of the Roman Empire, the history of Israel, its politics, and its religion in his time are all significant as the backdrop for showing who Jesus is, both Jesus as a person and Jesus as God come to earth. The kingdom of God needs to be understood not as a place, nor as a political entity, but the relationship between the king and his subjects. That is, the sovereignty that the king exercises over his people. The New Testament pictures the church as God's chosen people, the theme which has been already developed in the Old Testament where the Hebrew scriptures teach us the special place of Israel as God's chosen people. In the Gospels, we see Jesus coming into the world and changing that concept to what the Hebrew scriptures had always revealed God's intention to be, that God's chosen people would reach out to all people and that all people would come under the reign of the King from heaven. And yet this has been elusive. The Israelites, as God's chosen people, often turned to their own ways and turned away from God, and often had little to no interest in bringing the nations outside Israel to the true and living God. We should be able to look at history and say that churches have also frequently failed to extend the kingdom of God, nor and they have failed to completely instill in people that Jesus is not only our Savior, that he is not only the perfect example and teacher, but that he is ruler over his people. To dig deeper into this concept, I want us to go back into some biblical terms and the history of some of these terms. And I want you to to consider how that is the backdrop for understanding who Jesus is when he comes into the world and when he ascends back into heaven. There are three terms that are frequently used interchangeably, but at times there is a precise difference between them. Those words are Hebrews, Israelites, and Jews. Technically, people weren't called Jews until after Judah was all that was left of the kingdom of God's chosen people. And Israelites were known as Israelites only after Israel or Jacob uh, brought his children together as a people and then Moses led their descendants out. 
Hebrews goes back as far as Abraham. Now, Israelites are Hebrews and Jews are Israelites, but it's an ever more narrow term as you, as you look at how to use those different words. That will figure into what we look at in this brief overall view of the history of God's chosen people. We've talked about kingdom. And that is the sovereign authority of God in Christ over his subjects, those who choose to submit to God's rule. Nation, we need to, uh, even though I'm about to show you a lot of maps, we need to separate the concept from a map. Countries show up on most maps that we see. A nation is a group of people who share a common identity, often an ethnic identity or a history. Uh, one way of looking at that is to look at our own country in America, uh, largely populated by the descendants of Europeans. But there were people here before the Europeans came, and they are also nations, even though they have American citizenship. There is a Cherokee nation, for example. Uh, there is a Creek nation, that is, a people who are tied together by some bonds of history, culture, or ethnicity. The Jews are, in that sense, a nation, whether they are dispersed all over the globe or whether they are living in the nation of Israel. Now, as we look at history, we're going to have to see that at times Israel was nothing but a province in a large empire. Uh, particularly, uh, Judah was a province of the uh, Persian kingdom by the time we get to the end of the Old Testament. Uh, and in the New Testament, uh, a province in the empire of, of Rome. That being said, with that framework, let's see what the backdrop is for Jesus coming into the world when Israel existed as a client kingdom, mostly a province of the Roman Empire. To do that, I want us to put some perspective on the history of God's chosen people in the Hebrew Scriptures. You'll notice on the lower right of the screen that we, uh, we have two dark blue uh, items. That is the entire time in which there was actually a kingdom of Israel that was an independent kingdom. And even that was divided into two different kingdoms for 200 of the 330 years there was such, uh, such a kingdom. So you come back and there have been Hebrews and Israelites much longer than there has been a kingdom of Israel. Before the kingdom divided, before there was a united kingdom, there were 325 years, estimated, when Israelites simply were a very loose association of people with, uh, with a, um, a common heritage in their ancestry, and they were judged by judges, not in the sense in which we think of a, uh, a trial and court, but uh, deliverer judges. There were individuals who rose up to deliver their tribe and their uh, associated tribes in times of crisis. That 325 years came after the 70 years of wandering in the wilderness that I'm sure you've studied along the way some, somewhere. If we take the date of 1446 as the time that Moses led the Exodus as the Israelites left Egypt, when they weren't ready to do what God said, he left them to wander in the wilderness for 70 years, which preceded the time of the Judges. There's then this huge expanse of time before that, 430 years, that the Israelites, beginning with the actual literal sons of Israel, lived in Egypt and much of that time in slavery. You go back, this, uh, if you look at the top of the screen, the white uh, object, 
There were Hebrews before there were Israelites. The time of the patriarchs we have done is 224 years going back to 2100 BC. And so you had the time of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Then you had the time of the sons of Israel and their descendants in Egypt. You had the Exodus when people were not ready to move on as God told them to. He left them to wander in the wilderness of the Sinai for 70 years. They finally came together under Joshua, took some of the land, and occasionally deliverer judges would arise and they were a loose association of tribes of common ancestry for 325 years before, under Saul and then David and then Solomon, the tribes finally united as a true independent kingdom. And in the time of Solomon, quite a strong kingdom. It didn't last. After Solomon, who turned to idols, the kingdom divided into two roughly equal um, sections geographically, with the northern tribes being called Israel and the southern two tribes being called by one of the names Judah. So looking closer, you have 200 years from Abraham until the children of Israel in Egypt. You've got that 70 years in between that they're just wandering around in the desert of Sinai and are the Negev, the south of what we think of as Israel. And then you have 325 years of the earliest nationhood of Israelites when they're really just independent tribes. You push that history up to this uh, smaller section at the top of the timeline and you've got the kingdom. Now, there is a divided kingdom that I mentioned as being uh, 200 years long. Now, that's when all 12 tribes would have been represented in their assigned territories, even though they are divided as far as uh, who, is, uh, who is their king. They have separate kings. But in 722, it's important to understanding the background, the northern kingdom is taken captive by the Assyrian Empire. The Assyrians destroy the northern kingdom of Israel and it's never uh, restored. Meantime, the southern part of the divided kingdom, Judah, continues for another 138 years. From 722 to 786 BC. But during this time, with only a few breaks, they are very much under the control of Assyria, sometimes under siege, and they're not exactly a client kingdom of the Assyrian Empire, but the Assyrian Empire is so powerful that they overshadow and control the kingdom of Judah. Again, moving what we've covered up here, we come to a less familiar part of the history of Israel. Probably you are familiar with the 70 years of captivity in Babylon. The Assyrian Empire has fallen to a new empire, Babylon. Babylon gets fed up with the resistance of Judah and they finally take over Judah. They also transport all but the poorest to the poor from Judah so that there are neither Jews nor Israelites of any significance in the promised land. And it is 70 years before any of them return. By this time, the Babylonian Empire has been taken over and is now the Persian Empire. It is Cyrus the Great of Persia who announces that Jews may return to their homeland in Judah. And so Judah then exists as a Persian province for 186 years. Um, they start going back in 538. Um, 
and 516, not as many as you would think. Uh, perhaps a third of all the Jews who had been, uh, the Jews from Judah who had been uh, exiled to Babylon, maybe a third of them do come and they create this pretty much around the environs of the city of Jerusalem, this semi, I wouldn't even call it independent, this uh, sub subordinate province of Persia called Judah. Well, as you know your ancient history, I guess you know that Greece under Alexander the Great takes over the Persians after Alexander dies young, the Ptolemies and the Seleucids uh, take over after him. So these Greek leaders from about 330 to 180, I mean 330 to, um, to um, 140, they take over. The, of the two groups, it's mostly the Seleucids, which would roughly be um, Syria and Lebanon today. Uh, those people pretty much control the Judeans at that time. Remember, two-thirds of the Israelites are still spread out, are dispersed. It's called the Diaspora in what used to be the Assyrian and Babylonian and Persian empires. There is one brief uh, period when the nation of Israel arises again. And what is significant to our study of the life of Christ is that it is within 150 years of the time of Christ, 140 BC. Now, 140 years, if you were to go back in time for us in the United States, that would be after the Civil War. Uh, it's um, there were people still alive when I was young who'd been alive during uh, the Civil War, one or two of them. Uh, the um, the Hasmoneans, we'll also uh, briefly refer to them as the Maccabees, uh, revolted against their overlords, the Seleucids, and they did establish an independent kingdom, depending on how you date it. Um, from about 140 forward for um, forward to um, until the time that Rome took over, but uh, 113 of their years, Rome is really uh, overshadowing the client kingdom. Uh, we will get to much more about uh, Herod, who took over after the Hasmoneans, and this is the background. In AD 70, the Romans destroy Jerusalem. The kingdom of Israel, the kingdom of Judah, the province of Judah is no more. And it's 137 years before any Jews are back in Jerusalem. What I'm wanting you to see is that although you can't tell by the uh, relative size of the squares, there was a glory day when there was a kingdom of Israel. It was divided. There were 120 years when there was a united kingdom of Israel with a much more broken kingdom after that, taken into captivity twice, allowed to come back by the Persians, but most did not come back. After they were a Persian province taken over by the uh, people who inherited the Greek kingdom from Alexander Great, the Seleucids, and then only briefly, this breakaway, uh, maybe maybe a hundred years of an independent kingdom, but it also is, is taken over by Rome. And then things get so out of hand that Rome completely destroys the Jewish nation. Of course, what you need to notice is that we are now, as we talk about 63 BC to AD 70, we've got the time of Christ in here. From the very end of Herod the Great's rule, for a very short 30 years, there we have the life of Christ. And 
the kingdom that Israelites think of as God's chosen people has been dominated by empire after empire and is currently dominated by the Roman Empire. As we're trying to apply history to culture, I want you to be aware, in passing at least, that there were uh, two groups of Jews in in this period. If One way you can divide the Jews into two. There were those who had accepted Western culture, that is, when the Greeks came, which was much uh, different than traditional Jewish culture. And by the time Alexander came and spread the uh, Hellenic, we call them, or Greek ways, uh, a significant number of Jews decided they didn't want to be distinctly Jewish, and they thought they could still call themselves Jews and live like the Greeks. The Romans maintained the Greek ways and Western ways, and so when Jesus is alive in this very short time, there is this tension between traditional Jews who want to keep their own ways and the more... Um, worldly sophisticated Jews who want to maintain their Jewishness but don't mind uh, assimilating into the culture of their day. It is in this complex world that Jesus enters and lives as a person. So if now we're going to talk about the rulers of Palestine in the time of Jesus, we're going to, first of all, realize it starts and ends with Rome. Rome was already uh, taking over the world when the Maccabees revolted against the Seleucids, who were Greeks. The Maccabees held out for maybe a hundred years. Uh, we're saying Maccabees instead of Hasmoneans because we're breaking that down a little more specific. Maccabees is hammer. One leader of this family, uh, Judas, uh, was a great warrior and he was called the Hammer. And so the Maccabees became, from being warrior leaders who gained independence for uh, the Israelites, the Jews, uh, the Maccabees ruled. They gradually became more kingly and took on the family name the Hasmoneans. At the end of the line of the Hasmoneans leads to the Herodians, that is, Herod the Great, who was not from the Maccabee family, the Hasmonean family, marries into it, and he takes over, and it is he and his descendants who predominate over the land of Palestine throughout the period of the New Testament. All of this under the strong control of the Roman Empire. Uh, don't worry too much that we are looking at a complex chart, but do remember the uh, 16 decades had this some sense of order and continuity in the identity of who the people of God were, but it was an ugly and complex continuity. Starting at the top, you have this one who was the ruler, Mattathias, followed by a son named Simon, and then his, um, his brother takes over, and then when he dies, you go back to Simon's descendants and come down to a, 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 another generation down, and you get this Aristobulus and the various ones that lead down until Herod the Great. So we're going from 167 to 4 B.C. Judas Maccabeus is a warrior. Aristobulus decides that he can be both priest and king over the objection of, of a number of people, including uh, some uh, Zadokites who said you needed to come from the house of Zadok. And uh, they were somewhat uh, the group that became the Sadducees we're familiar with in the New Testament. You get down to the period of Herod the Great. He doesn't, for any, uh, any reason whatsoever, consider himself to be the priest, the high priest, but he appoints one, including, uh, well, we'll get into more of that later. He marries into the royal family when he marries Mary Amni, one of his many wives, and that brings the Herodian dynasty in. And as you know, uh, 
we get down to Herod the Great and we're to the one who was the king of the client kingdom of Judah, uh, of Israel, when Jesus is born, Herod the Great. Now, not much of the life of Jesus includes Herod the Great, but that does help us to date the coming of Jesus in history. So, you have this history, 160 years before Jesus, and we are looking to see what, how does Herod become king? Well, the family of Herod the Great is a complex mess of a, of a soap opera. Someday you should pull out, I, I read an interesting biography of Herod the Great, but uh, this one, and I don't remember who made it, uh, shows all the interactions, the marriages within the family, uh, cutthroat despots, leading up to Herod the Great, who was, as, as everyone knows, the king when Jesus was born. Now, Herod doesn't live much longer after Jesus is born, but his stamp has really set a contrasting figure to the king of kings who's born in the manger. Well, a good half century before Jesus comes into the world, Herod is already busy. He is uh, an Idumean, that is uh, from what used to be called Edom, became Idumea, and while the Jews were gone, spread closer to the land of uh, uh, the land of promise, and was just south of uh, Judea in the time of the New Testament. He made his way in to the royal family. He became a valuable uh, asset in uh, dealing with the empires around the nation. And he made good relations, or let's say uh, profitable relations with the Roman Empire. In fact, even going to school with people who became emperor. And first, before all of uh, his rise to power, he was married in 47 to a woman named Doris, who was the father of Herod's oldest son, Antipater, who will show up later. While he is still married to Doris, some unusually bad things happen in his family. His father is poisoned by someone for his own reasons, Herod is unhappy with his wife Doris and banishes her. Things are going badly enough in the family that his brother commits suicide. After getting rid of this wife, he does marry into the royal family of Judah. The Hasmoneans are ruling. There is a woman available for him to marry, and Herod then increases his chance of being an important person uh, by marrying Mary Amni. Mary Amni has two sons, Alexander and Aristobulus. In the year that his son is born, his first son with Mary Amni, his brother-in-law drowns in Herod's swimming pool in Jericho, which, by the way, the ruins are there and you can go see it. His brother-in-law, Herod had made high priest, even though the brother-in-law was in his middle teens. And as a young man, as a teenager, he drowns. And of course, some people wonder if Herod had anything to do with that. As you move forward, remember the numbers are moving backwards. There's another son, Aristobulus, born. Soon, Herod is getting paranoid about the royal, the ex-royal family being a threat to his position as king, and he executes both his wife and, his, and her mother. He marries another Cleopatra, not the one you've heard of, but another person uh, from Jerusalem named uh, Cleopatra, has a son named Philip. Uh, sometime before the year 23, he marries another woman named Malthace, who is the mother of another son who becomes important, uh, Archelaus. Uh, 
whose brother Antipas is also important in the New Testament story. As we're getting close to the end of uh, Herod's life, he had exiled or kicked out his first son Antipater, and he names him as the heir. Two sons that stand in the way, Alexander and Aristobulus, he has strangled just a few years before Herod dies. Uh, Herod has his sons strangled to death. He becomes uh, paranoid about his oldest son Antipater, and he has him executed in the last uh, last months of his life. He married a bunch of other people, including two nieces. Some of these had children. But this was a man who was brutal in the pursuit of power, who was immoral, who claimed to be king of the Jews, when the true king of the Jews came into the world in Bethlehem. By way of review, this is or actually anticipating the years beyond the time of Jesus. We do find Herod the Great in the story of the birth of Jesus. But he dies uh, when Jesus is a young boy. And then we know from history, not just from the Bible, that these sons of Herod are given different areas to rule. Aristobulus was supposed to get the biggest part of the kingdom. Uh, no, I'm sorry, Ar Ar Archelaus was, but he turns out to be a very bad king, and the Romans get rid of him, and they just take over. There is also a Herod Antipas called Herod the Tetrarch. Uh, almost all references to Herod, besides the birth story of Jesus, are to this Herod Antipas. There's also a Philip, not to be confused with Herod Philip, and then the ones that descend to the next generation come from Aristobulus. By the time you get into the book of Acts, uh, almost all of the references to Herod in Acts are Herod Agrippa I, who married Herodias, who was the wife of Philip. And then there's a Herod Agrippa II, who marries his um, sister, sister-in-law, sister, of sister, other consorts of some kind, who also has a, a sister, uh, Drusilla, who marries the governor Felix that shows up in the book of Acts. And so you can see for generations, this Herod family is just uh, power hungry and really a blight on what the rule of God's people should be. We are going to look at maps because as Jesus travels, I want you to be familiar with uh, the culture including who's in charge, the culture of the different regions of Palestine, Israel. You'll remember that this stretch of land is like a little piece of, of the state of Alabama. It's not that big. Uh, maybe 90 miles across here, maybe 150 miles north and south. Well, it was divided. Uh, some of them were political units. Some of them were ethnic regions. In the time of Jesus, there was a tetrarchy that just has to do with how much tetrarch is, how much the person rules over, arc means ruler, of this Philip. It doesn't play much into the Gospels, but it's a part of it. Um, there was an independent section. When the Greeks took over this area, they established a uh, cities that followed the Greek model for cities and promoted Greek culture. And 10 of those, by the time of the New Testament, were known as the Decapolis. They were independent Greek cultured cities, uh, not a part of the kingdom of Israel. There was also a region that was ethnic uh, that was the Samaritans. Uh, you're probably familiar, we'll cover it later, but the Samaritans were uh, had Jewish blood in them, but they were people who intermarried with the locals while most of Israel and Judah was away in captivity. They, there was great tension between the Samaritans who were centered in Samaria and the Jews who were centered in Jerusalem, but who also lived up in Galilee. So now looking at the numbers, there are three important uh, political entities that do bear into the movements of 
Jesus in, uh, in the Gospels. Galilee is where Jesus is mostly. Galilee is ruled by Herod Antipas. The territory of Antipas is an odd-shaped, long, diagonal section that includes what's one and two in, on this map. They are narrowly separated by the city of the Decapolis, and they are on both sides of the Jordan River. So, Galilee, Herod, Antipas. Perea, Herod, Antipas. Judea, at least uh, for a very little bit of the time of Christ, is governed by Archelaus. This is who inherits the territory uh, after Herod the Great dies when Jesus is a very young child. But as you look at Jesus traveling, he'll be starting out in Galilee, which is his home. He will sometimes travel to Judea and Jerusalem. He will sometimes travel from there or from Galilee into Perea, which, oh, you can think of Perea as maybe where John the Baptist was. Those were the ones who controlled the territory in the years leading up to the time of Jesus. And in the time of Jesus, it's the Herodians. Now, politics and government is only one part of culture. And in Jewish identity, remember Jesus is born into Jewish culture in a Jewish family, descended from the most important of, of the Jews. Jewish religion is more important to Jewish identity than the kings and emperors and warriors who have been a part of their history. There were unifying factors that all Jews kept in their sense of identity. They knew who they were, and even though they had differences of how they interpreted Judaism, first and foremost, they were all Jews, and they were together by a certain identity. By the way, the picture on this slide is a, uh, a synagogue in Capernaum, a city where Jesus spent much time and a city in which he preached at a synagogue and the layers under the layers of this synagogue uh, are still there that were there in the time of Jesus. He worked in a Jewish culture, he lived in a Jewish culture, and he preached in a Jewish culture. Let's look at the unifying factors of Jewish culture in his day. Above all, what unified the Jews was their monotheism. Every Jew, every day, says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. The distinctiveness of Judaism versus all the religions around them is that they are monotheists. Now, before the Babylonian and Assyrian exiles, Israel had gone back and forth between polytheism and monotheism, but the exile seems to have cured them. They were truly monotheistic from then forward. Now, there was this Jewish national identity. They see themselves as God's chosen people, and they do that because it's been revealed in the scriptures that they are God's chosen people. They also look at their land, and in particular, Jerusalem, as God's chosen place. That's their concept because their scriptures say that, that God has given them this land and that Jerusalem is the place in which he would have his temple. They believe that God has a special destiny for them. From the time of Abraham, when Hebrew identity began, They've been promised that all the nations of the earth would be blessed through Israel. They have developed what we know to be in the Old Testament, 
the promise of a Messiah. It seems that between Old and New Testament times, the concept of the Messiah was shaped in, in, in various ways, but there was very much in the minds of God's people that there was a deliverer, an anointed one, who would come and relieve them. Remember, they have had the conflict of this sense of destiny, sense of being God's chosen people, and this sense of being the land is given to them by God. This so strongly identified them that it was at odds with the reality that Rome dominated them in the time of Jesus. They had before the time of Jesus. Only briefly did the Maccabees, the uh, Hasmoneans, and the Herodians uh, have a small uh, Jewish kingdom. Before that, they were dominated by the Seleucids, who took over from Alexander the Great, who conquered the Persians, who conquered the Babylonians, who conquered the Assyrians, with the Assyrians and the Babylonians removing the Jews and the Israelites from their homeland, with only a third of them ever to return. So, of course, Jews are looking for the Messiah. They're looking for the Deliverer. And indeed, the prophets said that God would raise up such a one. So, first of all, there's the unity of Jewish identity that is reinforced by religious practices that were common to all groups of Jews. I need to take a moment to talk about the synagogue. There's a difference between synagogue and temple. For Jews, in biblical times, and for many Jews today, there is only one temple, the one in Jerusalem. Today, uh, many, perhaps most Jews, would say there is no real temple until God restores the Jerusalem temple to the Jews. As I'm sure you're probably aware right now, although Jews have some access to the ruins of where the temple was, it's actually controlled uh, by uh, Islamic, an Islamic um, committee organization. So what did they do after the Babylonians destroyed the uh, great temple of Solomon? Well, they were in exile. So they created local religious communities that came together, the Greek word synagogues, from which we get synagogue, was a, an assembly, a gathering. And so they would gather together, if they had more than a dozen Jewish men in a community, they would regularly come together at the synagogue, particularly on the Sabbath. Jews continued to observe the Sabbath even uh, when they had been taken from their homeland and continued to make that central to their religion. They also had their focus sharply on the temple. In a disappointingly uh, plain way, the Jews had rebuilt an altar, uh, uh, a temple in Jerusalem uh, a few hundred years before the time of Christ. It was uh, not a magnificent structure, but by the time of Jesus, Herod the Great, who had a massive building program, he built temples of all kinds to various gods. But in Jerusalem, he made a truly beautiful and large uh, temple structure around the one that the returns from exile had made. And it was a, a wonder to behold. And so they were all very proud of their identity with that temple, even though it was a, a corrupt a king who had... Uh, paid for it, they identified with the temple. What has continued to the present day is the identity of being Jewish, is shared scripture and shared tradition. Tradition is as important to being Jewish in some ways as scripture is. We're going to separate this into the Torah and the traditions of the elders. Um, in English Bibles, you'll probably have 
I have this referred to as the law, meaning the law of Moses. Uh, in English today, we speak perhaps of the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. That is the Torah, or the Torah, the central scriptures of the Jews. Equally, they kept orally for century after century the traditions of their elders through their rabbis. Eventually, well after the time of Christ, these were written down into traditions that define what it is to be Jewish in your religion. So three things with the um, overarching identity being there that Israel's God is the one and only God. There then beyond that, these three unifying elements of Jewish culture. All Jews understand that the Jews are God's chosen people living in God's chosen place with God's promised destiny to be delivered by his promised Messiah. They all value keeping their religion through synagogue and Sabbath and at the time of Jesus in a beautiful temple in Jerusalem. Throughout all their years, when in exile, as well as when they returned, as well as today, their shared written religion in the Torah, the first five books of, of today's uh, Christian Jewish Bible, and in their traditions that were carefully kept uh, by their elders and rabbis, this is what united Jews. Their scriptures. Most prominent in the Gospels are the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Not mentioned are the Essenes and only barely mentioned are the Zealots. Our textbook also groups people together that are not really a group. Uh, those who are following apocalyptic thinking, which we'll define later, and I'm just going to call them the apocalyptics. You do need to be very familiar with who the Pharisees are and the Sadducees. Uh, the Essenes and the Zealots are important, and the apocalyptics are in a way, but you shouldn't really think of them as a particular uh, group like Pharisees or Sadducees. Now, there were these other groups that were not entirely religious. We read in the Bible of the Herodians in the New Testament, but except for the name, we really don't know who they were. They're evidently people who think they're on Herod's side. And then there is this group that you are probably familiar with, the Samaritans. They were at odds with the Jews who were based in Jerusalem. They were, as the Jews of Jerusalem tell the story, the Samaritans were ethnically and religiously mixed Jews. Their identity had been watered down. I say according to the Jews in Jerusalem. Jesus also tells a Samaritan woman uh, that the Jews have their word from God. While the Jews were, it, almost all of them, away in exile, they developed their own brand of Jewish religion. They had built their own temple on Mount Gerizim in the area we call Samaria. But when the Maccabees took over, they saw the Samaritans as an impure, adulterized version of Judaism, and they destroyed their temple. Now, put that cultural context into your head this way. If an extremist group, an extremist religious group, came and destroyed the U.S. Capitol and the White House and the Supreme Court building, we would take that personally. We would remember that. And we wouldn't remember it well. We remember the atrocities committed before World War II. We remember people who have defied society, particularly if it's in 
our region. And so you can understand that the Samaritans did not warm up to the Jerusalem-based Jews. Only a hundred years ago, they had actually destroyed their temple. And so there were harsh conflicts between Samaritans and Jews, and we'll see that in the story of, um, of Jesus. I do want to mention to you, I can't remember it. Um, you'll have to Google it, something like thesamaritans.com or something like that. There are still roughly six or 700 Samaritans who live on Mount Gerizim. They continue to maintain their traditions and you can watch videos of their Passover celebrations, for example, where they actually slaughter the lambs and, and blow the trumpets. And uh, there still are Samaritans. They are on good relations with the Israeli Jews today, I understand. Now, how was Samaritan religion different and how was it the same as Jewish religion? Both consider the Torah to be scripture. However, the Samaritans said that their copy of the Torah, which in English we call the Samaritan Pentateuch, is the legitimate version and the Jews corrupted the original version to say what they wanted, for instance, where the temple should be. They particularly rejected the Hebrew scriptures because they elevated Jerusalem as the temple where people should worship. You'll remember that's what comes up in the discussion with the Samaritan woman and Jesus. Then there is this apocalyptic thought. It may be a new idea to you, but it is significant to understanding the time of Jesus. The word apocalyptic means revealed, taken out of hiding, uh, revealing something that has been secret. Apocalyptic writing style is very significant to the time of Jesus. Perhaps before we proceed, you should be uh, familiar with um, what we mean when we're talking about writing style. In the New Testament, the book of Revelation is apocalyptic, absolutely full of imagery about the battle between good and evil and the ultimate victory of good through God and his representative, the Messiah. It's also represented in some of the language of Jesus telling about the end of the world and in uh, significantly in some Old Testament prophecies, uh, uh, Ezekiel in particular, uh, and somewhat maybe in Daniel and, a few, and some other places in the Old Testament. However, some of what is existent in the time of Jesus is not necessarily even purported to be a special revelation from God, although it is presented as if it were written by a holy person, usually from the past. Uh, if you go into uh, Books a Million today, you'll run into several shelves that say religious fiction. Or if you look hard enough, you can find a section that says historical fiction. They take something that is known of history or something that is known of biblical times, and they write a story as if it were happening then. They're not saying that this is true. They're just saying, imagine that this happened in the childhood of Jesus, or imagine what it was like when Moses was a boy or something like that. It's not that simple, but it's not meant to be a fraud. They just, the narrator might be um, Samuel or Moses or somebody like that. Often the literature is presented as an angel explaining a very confusing message. Now, as we said, there are inspired scriptures which have this style, both in the Hebrew scriptures and the Christian scriptures. And the most classic example for Christians is, of course, the book of Revelation. Apocalyptic literature frequently used extravagant visions and predicted the future. A lot of people, that's why they want to study the book of Revelation. It, it's uh, fantastic in the sense that it is fantasy. Uh, it is uh, 
almost like science fiction to us today. Uh, it is uh, angels and demons and and different colored horses. It, it is purposely dramatically unreal by human standards. Besides the style, there are important themes in apocalyptic thought. One is that God is absolute ruler. God is far above anything that is human. And I believe that this is very much a part of the setting of the story of Jesus. It's all about God having his people assume his rule again, take over, uh, return themselves to his being the ruler. And Jesus is said in contrast to a culture in which rulers were as corrupt as corrupt could be. Apocalyptic literature deals with this uneasiness for those who believe in God. Similarly, an apocalyptic theme is that this evil world is part of a cosmic struggle between good and evil. There is a world beyond this world, and the good and evil that we see in this world is a reflection of or is reflected by a battle beyond the heavens or in the heavens between good and evil. And therefore, our miseries, our persecutions for our religion are parallel to the battles between God and Satan, between the angels and the demons. You can see that in video games and uh, and comic novels and, and, and fantasy movies today, uh, TV shows. But they were doing it for a religious purpose, to make the religious point that whatever we're struggling with because of our religion, God is fighting the same battle in the other world. Following up on that idea is the apocalyptic theme that this world is passing away. What makes people wise in this world? What makes people strong in this world? It doesn't last forever. And the conclusion then of apocalyptic thinking and writing is that it's going to take divine intervention. God is certainly going to bring this evil age, this temporary existence to an end. And so soon our trials will be over. Our, our struggles will cease and God will bring it all to a grand and glorious end. The theme of apocalyptic, the theme of the book of, the, of Revelation is that ultimately, no matter how bad it seems, God will triumph. Now Jesus came into the world when this had been popular Jewish writing uh, for over a century, and it continued to be popular Jewish writing for a century to come. So this was a part of mentality of the religious culture of his day, although not universally agreed upon, perhaps seen as extreme or just as literary license. But the themes, the themes of apocalyptic are related to the coming of Jesus into the world. That's it for this lecture. Here's what we have coming up in this unit still. Uh, we're going to talk about the four written Gospels, that is, uh, the, the nature of the uh, structure and genre. You've got some uh, reading and questions to do on that for chapter three of your textbook. Then we have a lesson on the Gospel of Matthew and how it stands out. You've got to take care of chapter four in your textbook. And uh, there are two different lectures on that one. Uh, the one after we discuss the textbook will be based on the reading of Matthew chapters 1 through 20. And you should have already read that by now. We'll be looking on at how he, um, how he structures his report of the ministry of Jesus. In the next lesson, we'll compare the Gospels of Mark and Luke to Matthew. Uh, that means you've got to do chapters 5 and 6 in your textbook. And we will look at what particularly stands out in the uh, 
the text of Mark and Luke, and then uh, you'll have you have certain assigned passages to read from Mark and Luke, and we're going to uh, have a lecture on how they present the ministry of Jesus, particularly how they present it differently than Matthew. That leaves us with the Gospel of John, which is unique and different in a lot of ways. Uh, the um, seventh chapter of your textbook will introduce that. And for the lecture that we're going to have on how John presents the ministry of Jesus, uh, I want you to read the first 11 chapters of John. Then the last lesson in this uh, unit is uh, what the textbook talks about, the man from Galilee, the life of Jesus Christ. And we'll be looking at how you harmonize the four Gospels. You'll be reading chapter 8 of the textbook and answering those questions, and I'll be presenting some ideas on harmonizing chronologically or otherwise harmonizing the Gospels. Now, you still have uh, two more things to be concerned about. You have to begin work on your term paper. You look in Blackboard and you'll see the explanations of what's due and when. And you also have a unit exam that will cover the course content that we've uh, presented so far. That's it for today.